Well, I think 2020 was very dramatic for the world in many ways. By a long way, COVID has to have been the biggest drama for all of us. Some countries have been worse affected than others. Uh, some have made a better job of managing it and of rolling out the vaccines and of putting in place proper test and tracing mechanisms. But it's been unprecedented and very few governments have emerged with total credit. And it's been more difficult, of course, for democracies than for more autocratic regimes uh, because <laughs> there are personal liberties at stake uh, and there are votes to be won and to be lost. But the economic effect, the social effect, uh, the employment effect on so many people of COVID, I think, has been uh, very significant. So I think that's the main thing. The second thing, of course, which historians will, will remember forever, is the extraordinary way in which the US election has unfolded. There have been many people, including the outgoing President Donald Trump, who predicted that the only outcome on the 3rd of November that he would accept would be a victory and that he would contest any result which was not four more years for himself. He lost the election, as the world knows. He did not accept that. He still contests it. And a great deal of difficulty and, I think, damage to the American democratic process flowed from that. Uh, many other governments around the world have been rubbing their eyes in disbelief at what's happened to the leader of the free world. And of course, those uh, prime ministers and presidents around the world who were very cozy with Donald Trump have been busy uh, trying to scramble to improve their potential relationship, their future relationship with the incoming government. That's the way politics works. And so now looking at 2021, we have to hope that the world is finally being able to use vaccines and careful management of the of the spread of the virus to move towards a better year for social life, for economy, for prosperity, uh, and that the United States will, if you like, calm down with a more inclusive uh, government coming in and a president who is keener on collective solutions to the world problems than the more unilateral approach that we have had from Donald Trump. The first thing that we should expect is that top priority will be given to dealing with America's domestic problems. Uh, there is, of course, the mess of the election and the violence on Capitol Hill uh, in early January, which has to be cleared up, if you like. Uh, there is still a number of processes, as I speak, which have to be gone through before uh, the inauguration, but we're almost there. And then I think what you will see is this massive stimulus package which uh, the incoming president has been touting, uh, plus, I think, attempts to try to heal some of the wounds and the polarization and the divisiveness uh, within American political life and society, which we have um, been witnessing in recent months. So I think the domestic agenda and trying to address some of the grievances which lie behind the fact that despite everything, Donald Trump received 10 million more votes this time around than he did four years ago. You know, that is an alarm bell for people who care about democracy and about leveling up and inequalities and many of the other difficulties in America. And then I think internationally, what we would expect is that this president will be much more keen on working with allies. Uh, the United Kingdom, I think, is well placed because it's, it's going to be a president of the G7 meeting in Cornwall in June, and then it's got the uh, climate change summit in Glasgow in the fall. So I think two opportunities uh, in the coming months for the president and, but, and many, many other global leaders to come to uh, the United Kingdom. That's a, that's a plus for Britain. But I think it's also going to be an opportunity for the incoming president and his team to show how ready they are to work with other world leaders on everything from climate change to dealing with the rise of China, uh, the issues of cybersecurity, broader um, attacks on democracy, and many of the other issues which have been addressed, trade policy as well, which have been addressed in a way that's not been collective as in the past and needs to be addressed by different uh, heads of government working together to try to find common solutions. Well, I think that having addressed uh, or begun to address the big domestic issues which America is confronting, uh, I do think that the Biden administration will want to, as they see it, put right uh, some of what has gone wrong uh, during the Trump years. 
They will want to work with allies. They will want to strengthen rather than weaken NATO. They will want to engage with the European Union rather than try and score points and, and insult European leaders. I think they will want to have a different approach to the series of issues that arise from China's strength and China's assertiveness, but working with allies rather than doing it all by itself. I think the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, North Korea is an obvious example, uh, is going to be a priority. And I do think that for a number of reasons, both weapons of mass destruction potential and also because of domestic politics and so on, uh, the administration will want to sort out the muddle that Iran has become because of course, President Donald Trump tore up the nuclear deal with Iran, which America, along with five other major countries, including the United Kingdom, uh, negotiated back in 2015. And then I think there are complex relationships with countries like Saudi Arabia and Turkey with which President Trump has been very cozy, where I think the Biden administration will want to look afresh uh, at what's going on in those countries and what United States interests are in those in those uh, that part of the world. Plus, of course, uh, what Donald Trump used to call the unending wars, the very long standing tragic conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, where America is rapidly drawing down troops, but where there isn't peace and stability and democracy of the sort that people would have liked. Plus the problem of Yemen, where there is a humanitarian disaster going on, where frankly, the Trump administration wasn't interested and where I do think that uh, the Biden team will want to try once more to stop the slaughter and be involved in trying to bring some sort of a political settlement together. That's begun. There are some things happening, but it, it certainly needs a bit more help from outside players with muscle. Well, it's a book that I worked on for a few years since I left uh, British government service uh, at the beginning of 2016 when I finished my stint as ambassador in Washington. Uh, the title is They Call It Diplomacy. I've written it because a lot of people said to me, look, you've been in foreign service uh, and in and out of it because you worked in the European Commission, you worked in the palace for the royal family, you've worked as ambassador in many interesting countries. Why don't you write it down? Why don't you tell people what it was like? Because there's an awful lot to be said. So it's not really a, a full-blown memoir. It is a series of anecdotes and a certain amount of commentary from me based on the places that I feel that I know a bit about. You know, I was twice serving as a British diplomat in Turkey, twice in Paris and France, twice in the United States, once in Iran before the revolution. I served at the European Commission for a while. And so it draws on all those experiences, but it also, towards the end, has some commentary on where are we now in terms of the United Kingdom post-Brexit, uh, and what are the lessons that we can learn from uh, the state of America and what we've learned during the election campaign and some of the other issues which came to the surface during my time when I had the honor of representing the United Kingdom in the United States. So I like to think there's a few thoughts and a few comments also for those people and there are many of them who've come to me to say, uh, what's it like becoming a diplomat? How do you join the foreign service? Um, what's the job of an ambassador all about? So it tries to answer those questions as well. <laughs>